Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, event. We are really pleased to welcome Dr. Naomi Hossein. I actually first met Naomi in 2016. We were just talking about this. We were having dinner together in Bellagio, Italy, of all places, <laughs> <laughs> overlooking Lake Como. And we happened to be, we just were sitting together. And we started chatting, and of course we hit it off immediately. We had many research interests in common, we knew many people. And at that time she mentioned that her book is coming out in 2017. And so I followed her work since then, and it, indeed her book did come out in 2017 to much critical acclaim. And so we are very pleased to have uh, Dr. Hussein here today. <coughs> So Dr. Uh, Naomi Hossein is a political sociologist. She has over 20 years of development research experience. Her work focuses on the politics of poverty and public service, and increasingly, uh, increasingly on the political effects of substance crisis. Um, she has researched elite perceptions of poverty, accountability in education and social protection, and women's empowerment in countries from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and the UK. She's led cross-country research in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South and Southeast Asia. As I was joking with earlier, I'm like, she pretty much covers the entire world. Uh, so she has a lot of experience. Her book on the politi political effects of the 1974 famine in Bangladesh, the Aid Lab, was published by Oxford University Press in mm -hmm. February of 2017. So how did Bangladesh go from being a basket case quote unquote, Henry Kissinger's sort of infamous description in the late 1970s, to a development success story. Well, the how has been addressed um, by many researchers and scholars. What Naomi is really <coughs> interested in, however, is the why. Hossein's argument, Dr. Hossein's argument is really powerful. She argues that it all came down to five traumatic years in the early 1970s, when a massive cyclone was swiftly followed by a brutal war of independence from Pakistan, and that in turn was eclipsed by a hor horrific famine in which about 1.5 million people died. A famine so soon after independence caused a massive crisis of legitimacy for the government, whose overthrow a year later was seen as an expression of the loss of this legitimacy. And the traumas of the 1970s left a legacy of a political system that, for all its flaws, accepted the moral economy of protecting the people from climate, shocks, and hunger. Dr. Hossein describes her argument in more detail in an interview in Himal, where she says, in Bangladesh, the elite and their donors took inspiration from the economic development of these societies, where homogenous, dense populations had been transformed into human resources through public investments in education and health. Bangladesh's military rulers started to work on improving the conditions of rural women, curbing their fertility, sending their children to school, and protecting them and their families against common public health threats. Compared to many of its southern neighbors, Bangladesh made quick progress on immunization, reproductive health, and school enrollment, particularly among girls. Reaching the rural poor, particularly <laughs> women and children, meant being open to new ways of doing development and new actors for delivering it. Under the long period of military rule, civil society, NGOs, and activist groups emerged to fill the space left by the lack of progressive politics. Some pushed for the rights of women and the marginalized, others for attention to rural poverty and different forms of oppression. Donors began to channel funding through these fast-growing organizations, which quickly gained a reputation for delivering services, cheaply and effectively. As part of this settlement with aid donors, the government gave these Western-backed organizations space and license to operate. It balanced this liberalism with latitude towards Islamic education and welfare organizations <coughs> from the West Asian states. The book ends on the big question, can the country continue to develop? Hossein argues that Bangladesh is coming to the end of this phase <coughs> of its development and needs to address some of the weaknesses of its model in economic terms its excessive dependence on low-end garments and migration leave it vulnerable to shocks. Hanging over everything is also the menace of climate change, acute in the case of low-lying low flood-prone Bangladesh, as we are seeing now. So we very much look forward to Dr. Hussain's presentation tonight. A little bit about the Chaudhary Center. Um, so many of you are familiar with um, our, our various programs that we have throughout the semester. The Chaudhary Center really has three main goals 
The first is to showcase innovative research and ideas by hosting thought leaders and intellectuals like Dr. Hossein um, and from those who work on Bangladesh or those who are from Bangladesh. Just last week, we hosted Professor Vivek Bald, but he gave an excellent presentation here. And this Friday, we are pleased to host Rajiv and Nadia Santani, the founders of the Taka Art Summit. Our second goal is to train the next generation of scholars and expose students to Bangladesh and Bangladesh studies. In just a few years, we have, have had more than 20 faculty and students travel to Bangladesh through the center, sponsored 10 faculty-led workshops, supported more than 25 research projects, and over the last four years, we have supported eight Chaudhary Center fellows. We have at least one here, Samira, um, who have worked on a wide range of very fascinating topics, ranging from climate change, infectious disease, safe water, social enterprise, welfare of garment workers, the 1971 war, and improved child development. And finally, our focus through the center is to create opportunities for collaborative research between UC Berkeley and top universities in Bangladesh. And to that end, I'm very pleased to welcome our visiting <coughs> faculty members. We have eight faculty members visiting from Bangladesh and one from Sri Lanka. If you wouldn't mind just standing up so everyone can see who you are. And <laughs> they are visiting here for a week um, on an intensive workshop on research and writing, and we're really excited to have them here. I hope you'll all join us for the reception afterwards and you'll have a chance to meet one another. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Naomi. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sanjeev. You did that so well. Now, I'm not sure I have anything left to say. You've explained it so beautifully. And you made me sound really busy, <laughs> um, which I have been, I suppose. Um, among other things, promoting this book, it's quite hard, in America in particular, to get people interested in Bangladesh. So it's really nice to see a turnout. Um, today, and I'm really pleased to be in Berkeley. I have to say thank you very much to Sanjeev and to Panita, and also to Adele for organizing all this. It's really been great. You know, when I was a kid growing up in Bangladesh, somehow I read about University of uh, California, Berkeley, and I thought, I really want to go there. And I cannot imagine now, having finally visited any place more different from 1970s, 1980s Dhaka. I cannot imagine anywhere <laughs> less like it. But it's a real pleasure to be here, and it's very, really nice to see so many Bangladeshi scholars as well. Um, as Sanjita said, this book came out about a year ago, um, and it only took a couple of years to write, which I believe is quite short. But actually, it's based on more or less 20 years of work. You know, I did a lot of uh, aid type of research, a lot of, uh, 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 of, of, of commissioned research, all kinds of research in Bangladesh over 20 years, and never quite got round to writing it all up. And I used to get really annoyed with the World Bank and others who would you know, take all the credit for any of Bangladesh's successes. And mm -hmm. I thought, you know what? Somebody has to put this right. So I thought finally I would. Um, I should. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about the title. This is going to work. Um, the title is a very ugly title. Everyone who read this book when it was going through the draft said, such an ugly title. <laughs> such, how can you call it? Change the name. Have something nice instead about Bangladesh. And I said, no, you know what? It's an ugly title, but then actually the story is quite ugly. There are some really bad ethics that went on in the 1970s, the 1980s, and to this present day in Bangladesh. And I really wanted to draw attention with this title of the Aid Lab uh, to the role that Bangladesh has played in the world order, which I think really is, you know, we think about Bangladesh as the eighth biggest country in the world, right? By population, eighth biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, in the list of countries that your average American might know, it must be in the hundreds or something. You know, unless you buy your clothes in Gap and look at the label, unless you like cricket, none of these things, well, certainly not cricket is not a big thing here, probably you won't know anything about Bangladesh, you know, unless you've been there or you have some relationship to the place. So I think it's very interesting. But Bangladesh does play a very significant role, has played a very significant role. And that role is um, as, a, as a kind of a, an example, as an it's an ideological role, uh, which is to say that Bangladesh... Uh, proves that the market-driven model of development can work under the most difficult circumstances. If even Bangladesh can develop, then anywhere can do it. So you hear sometimes people say, why, why is Malawi, why is Somalia, why are they in this situation? <coughs> even Bangladesh could manage it, so why couldn't, you know? So there are lots of lessons, and the lessons from what has been done in Bangladesh in the name of development have been taken all around the world. In fact, I mean, we were just talking about another 
project I'm doing with BRAC, in fact, to, to take these lessons around uh, other low and lower middle income countries around the world. Um, what, what Bangladesh did, what can be learned from other places, something we talk about all the time. So we need to understand better the story of why and how this was done. So I've <coughs> enlarged this because uh, I'm going to tell, there are no graphs and no tables in this presentation, I'm sorry. It's all photographs, <laughs> um, except for this one, which is, of course, a rickshaw painting, as you will have recognized. Mm -hmm. And anyone, anyone know this building? The US Embassy. The US Embassy. You would get it, of course. The other contenders are in the room. There's an American flag there as well. Um, and, uh, you know, no, it's, not, it's not immediately obvious, un unless you know Bari Dharams, you know Dhaka, um, what that is. And I put that there really to remind us that Bangladesh is, Bangladesh is a huge country with you know, so many hundreds of millions of people, but actually it's very, very dependent on its position in the world, in the global world economy, in the global political economy even. And so I put that there to highlight the fact that Bangladesh is very much shaped by its external environment. Um, I, I call it the aid lab because there have been mm. lots of real experiments on, on the bodies and the landscape of Bangladesh. There's the, the infamous uh, arsenic poisoning that was the result of groundwater uh, projects in the 70s and 80s that were not properly tested. The, it's been called the biggest mass poisoning in world history. Then, of course, there's the Nor plant experiments where uh, Bangladeshi women had these uh, fertility drugs inserted into them because they couldn't, couldn't test them on American women, so they thought they'd test them on Bangladeshi women. Many women died. These sorts of uh, experiments happened, but in a way you can think of the whole country as a kind of a grand countryside experiment in development. What will work, what won't work. Bangladesh wasn't necessarily in a position to, to argue about that at the time. So as I said, I'm going to use only pictures. And um, uh, I got all these off the internet, Creative Commons, open source. Mm -hmm. I just love this one. Isn't that a fantastic picture? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to highlight with this picture how far Bangladesh has come. And I think if you've never been to Bangladesh and you pitch up in 2018, you'll think, this woman is crazy. What kind of success is this? You know, you go around the poshest neighborhoods and you'll see beggars, people with their arms chopped off, you'll see poverty, you'll see deprivation. And the fact is that it's much, much better than it was. The proportion of, poverty, the proportion of people living in poverty has dropped significantly, massively, in the last 40 years. So many other indicators have improved. What's really surprising about Bangladesh is not how, how well off people are now, but how, how bad the situation was in the 70s and how how, how nobody expected Bangladesh to succeed. So the famous basket case uh, epithet that you mentioned, which I have to say, in Henry Kissinger's defense, and no one will ever say anything as nice about this, <laughs> about him <laughs> as this, he didn't actually come up with that phrase. Right. We've got to Somebody keep in mind. Else. Somebody else did, but he repeated it, and he made it infamous. But anyway, the basket case language that was used in 1971 about Bangladesh really did reflect this idea that you could pour endless amounts of aid into this basket, and it would make no difference. It would just come out the other end. You could keep pouring, the place was hopeless. It was a lost cause. Um, and this is really what people thought about Bangladesh in the 70s, certainly in the US policy field. I've been looking at this more closely recently, and it's very clear. I show this because in the 70s, the image of, hi, welcome. The image of um, <coughs> Bangladeshi women was famine victims, <laughs> war, rape victims, it was hungry women. And now what do we have? We have Bangladeshi women, isn't she gorgeous? Bangladeshi women going around the world protecting people from war and disaster and famine. I mean, what a contrast. So we really have come very, very far. Um, and that's really why I wanted to show that. I think there is a surprise here. We got very far, pretty fast, compared to other South Asian countries, certainly, except for Sri Lanka except also for Nepal, it must be said. So not many South Asian countries, <laughs> but actually much, much faster than was expected. Um, and the, the basket case story, this is a picture. Does anyone know what this is? This is an image, image of, cyclone. that's right, the Buller cyclone of 1970. Yeah. Yeah. Now, because political scientists are political scientists, they tend to kind of ignore the fact that there is a kind of an, an ecological and natural element to what happens in the politics of a country like Bangladesh. All countries, but especially Bangladesh, I think. And 1970 was really, really very, very critical, not only for Bangladesh's political development, but also, I think, for the way it, it viewed the problem of disasters and the need for governments to respond. 1970 in November 
there was this enormous cyclone that killed something between a quarter of a million, half a million people, all in the, the Bay of Bengal and around uh, the Polar District. And the Pakistani government did nothing, really. I mean, they were lazy, they couldn't be bothered. They more or less said, oh, but they're so far away. They have, they have disasters like this all the time. What can we do? But the rest of the world came, and for the first time they saw Bangladesh. And what they saw was a real shock to them. I think they, um, there was a, a rather, rather uh, nifty quote from the CIA. They published a report which became declassified, I guess, in the 80s or 90s. And they said, you know, it was like a kind of an awe the CIA was saying about this place that they'd never seen until this cyclone happened and all the media, world media came. They'd never seen this place where they said, it's unique in that there are so many people, so poor, concentrated in such a la small landmass with no resources. <laughs> they had never seen anything like it. It was just a Malthusian hell. But more significantly, the Bahala cyclone happened just three weeks before the first democratic elections that Pakistan ever had. Imagine, the government knew there was an election coming. They had their own candidates in the field, and they still did nothing for the Bangladeshis until the international community pushed them. So of course, as we all know, the rest is history. Uh, Sheikh Mujib's Awami League won an overwhelming victory, which has been described as possibly the most, I forget what the word was, most impressive democratic victory ever. It was so stunning, and uh, was of course not allowed to um, take the seat of power in, in Islamabad because there was no way West Pakistan was being ruled by Bengalis. Um, uh, we had the, uh, the, the massacre from March 1971 in Bangladesh, and the rest is, of course, Bangladeshi history. But I think it really is important to keep in mind, and this is something I, I try to stress, that the origins really of, of, of Bangladesh are in this, this moment of ecological crisis, in this moment of failure of the, of the, of the Pakistani government to do what any decent government should do. And this, I think, must have stuck with the, the Bangladeshi elite as then became. Um, that's a nice one, too. That's Shabak. Isn't that a nice mm -hmm. picture? Um, a really central theme, to the extent that anyone has been talking about Bangladesh's surprising successes, a central theme has come from the World Bank, which is that there is a paradox here. How can a country do so well with growth and human development when its politics are so divisive and so fractious and so conflictual, I mean, because of course that didn't work for America at all, did it? But you know, uh, it's you know this paradox, this kind of idea that there's a paradox is that on the one hand we have growth and on the other we have this politics, and somehow they don't fit together. And and the World Bank usually resolves that in all their writings by saying it's because they followed our good policies, because <laughs> we told them what to do and they did it. That's why. So I don't obviously buy that argument at all. <laughs> um, and I think that, in fact, there is something very, very significant about the politics of Bangladesh which made it, which actually made this success possible. We're so used to being critical of our two begums and being so, but actually the most great, the greatest success we've had in Bangladesh has been since the return to democracy, such as it is, in 1990, 91, and that the, the regime of, of the two begums, one after another, one after another, now the current one for, it seems, the rest of time. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Oh, I forgot this has been videoed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that for a No, no, don't worry. Don't worry. I don't say anything I don't mean. I might say it jokingly. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this paradox, I think, is really overwritten. I think that we have to understand that actually the keys to the success of Bangladesh really do lie in a politics that really meant that the elite had a consensus, a very strong consensus. And that matters a lot what the elite were like, who these elites were, but they had a strong consensus on some things. And those things were the need to protect the population against disasters, against food crises, because food crises came from the global markets, they came from natural disasters and all sorts of things, had come historically through the British colonial rule from the, uh, <coughs> during the Pakistani period as well. And this, was, this, this had studied, if you like, the history of, of the Bay of Bengal. Uh, I think it's important to say a little bit about the development stuff. Um, Bangladesh is definitely, it is definitely a human development success story. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Professor Wahiduddin Mahmood and his colleagues have said there is a Bangladesh surprise. Right. And the Bangladesh surprise is that even though our GDP per capita income rates have never been that high, despite good growth rates, 
because uh, population's on the big side. Uh, actually, the investments in human development have been very successful. They have been, uh, compared to our income, the immunization rates, several of the gender equality indicators that they use for these uh, Millennium Development Goals. This is actually the Sustainable Development Goals, the new ones. I, I'm, I'm hoping that most people are a bit familiar with these. These are the UN targets mm. that they set mm. up and all the governments around the world are supposed to pursue them. Um, Bangladesh has done pretty well on all of, almost all of these, even things like infant mortality, even hard indicators like maternal mortality have improved. So there is something definitely to be explained there. Um, and gender equality is a really critical factor here. I'm going to talk a bit more about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is actually the only picture I don't have any permission for. Because I couldn't find, this is like a, this is, I don't think it's a real, I think it's like a vanity magazine. I couldn't find any evidence of it. Anyway, I'll, I'll, come, to, I'll come to Prince Musa in a second. Um, the kind of the theoretical kind of nub of the book, and I won't talk much about this because nobody likes theory, do they? Um, <laughs> is uh, that a kind of a social contract emerged. And I'm so glad you, you told the story about the famine, because I always forget to talk about the famine until it's a bit late. Because the famine is really at the core of this argument. Um, a kind of social, very special kind of social contract emerged in the, in the 70s, late the, the second half of the 70s. It was emerging from the 70s, perhaps even earlier, through the liberation struggle and so on, but really consolidated, you could say, in the second half of the 70s, where the ruling elites, were in a kind of agreement with the masses, the people who were most vulnerable to all of these disasters and so on, but also with the international aid donors. So when we think about a social contract, we always think of it citizens and state. Bangladesh is so, what's so important about Bangladesh is its position in the global political economy. And without, the, without understanding how its social contract is transnational, I think you don't really understand anything. But this, this contract really, what really, really mm. mattered uh, for how this came about in the wake of the famine is that the Bangladeshi elite are very unlike other South Asian elites. Uh, they're very unlike political elites anywhere except for um, maybe Taiwan or South Korea, uh, in that they are very, very similar to the masses. They're very, very similar to the rural masses. Mm. Uh, you know, we had, we had two waves of decolonization. Got rid of the British, got rid of the Pakistanis. Lots of other <laughs> non-Bengali Muslims were also kicked out or left at the time. So you're left with really an elite which is just like the rural masses from which they come. We're only a generation or two out of the villages ourselves. You know, you talk to uh, any of my father's generation, they, you know, they were the first ones to go to university. Before that, we were all Jomindar and uh, whatever, small landowners. What's the other one? Talibdar, thank you. That's the word. Talibdar. Those people. Um, so people had a kind of real connection with the rural masses, always had poor rural relatives, still now we have, I have, certainly in Rangpur. Um, we have, uh, that connection remained there. The Bangladeshi elite spoke the same language, had the same cultural background, the same religious practice. All of this is very unusual for political elites to be quite so similar to the masses. This meant there was always a connection. Um, now I put Prince mm. Musa here. I think some people have seen him. You know you can tour his house on YouTube. <laughs> it's really worth seeing. Um, I put him up here because he strikes me as, as a, a sign of change in the relationship between the elites and the masses in Bangladesh. People like this, he has the, most, the world's most expensive fountain pen, he has a million dollar watch. Mm. Um, you never had this. 20 years ago, this is not how the elites behaved. Uh, when I did my PhD work, oh, it's 20, more than 20 years ago now, um, on elites, you would never have got somebody like this showing off their wealth and saying, look at me, I'm so great. People were always at pains to show how they weren't you know, so rich and they wouldn't show their wealth. This is, this is a sign of the growing gap, definitely. The fact that the elite has been very much enriched. The masses have got better off, but the elite are greatly enriched, largely thanks, I think, to the garments industry and some other industries. But this is a sign of change and one of the reasons why this social contract is going to be weak going forward. Again, I mean, some of these pictures I just thought were beautiful. This is actually a picture by Cecil Beaton, who used to photograph Vogue. Mm. Isn't, that, isn't that kind of vogue when you look at it? Isn't it beautiful? And how traditional they look with their kolshi. You don't get this mati kolshi anymore. You never see it anymore. But the, the way in which the Bangladeshi elite viewed uh, the issue of women was very critical also to, this, to the success of the Bangladesh. Other people have written about this. Many people have written about this. 
Um, I think what really happened in Bangladesh was that for about a century already, uh, if we look at the work of Shabbat the Bose and others, we know that the, what we could call the agrarian contract, the patriarchal bargain that meant that women's labor, women's paddy processing labor, I think we don't, we forget now, but you know, in the olden days, women would spend eight, nine, 10 hours a day during the season, power boiling and whatever they used to do, 17 different processes just to get the rice. So women's labor used to be essential to the farmer household. Um, you know, diminishing land size, indebtedness, you know, overcrowding on the land, lack of investment. The agrarian uh, uh, economy was devastated for about 50 years before uh, Bangladesh came. But, but really, it was, it was really, you could see the signs in, in the number of women who are, you know, women-headed households are on their own, begging and so on. It, it started to become visible. When it really became very, very visible, the fact that women didn't really have a kind of, or many women didn't have a kind of protector in the in the traditional family role, the old patriarchal system, was after 1971, when uh, some unknown number of women, could be in the hundreds of thousands, were and children, should be said, were raped, and uh, there was something like 25,000 abortions were performed at that time. Can you imagine the scale of the rape? It was like a factory. Um, and this really was, you know, in a poor agrarian Muslim uh, setting, you know, such such devastation. We still haven't really, we have still haven't really um, recovered from that. I think in some ways. But uh, it, what it did was it made it made the new government really have to take into account the issue of women, the problem of the problem of what to do with women who's who, who've been kicked out of their families, maybe who who had no husband or no father because they'd been killed in the war or whatever. And this really put the issue of women's citizenship on the agenda. Bangladesh was very, very early to recognize these things, pioneering to recognize the victims of the rape and war. Uh, countries like Bosnia and others really learned from Bangladesh. It was really mm -hmm. Bangladesh that did this first. Not that it was all positive by any means, but it, what it meant was, for the first time, the state was having to think of women as citizens in their own right. This was very critical. So I showed this lovely traditional picture of these lovely women, but actually, Bangladeshi women were always at the core of the global political economy. This is another picture of Bangladeshi women, same photographer, I think. This is 1944, and it looks like they're building. I did some research on this. I think this is the old Dejgao airport, mm. which was from where the, the Pacific, some of the Pacific uh, theater was, you know, where the British, uh, the Allies flew their planes out of here to Burma and, and the East. No, this is this is definitely this was definitely in in uh, the uh, it was in Dhaka, but it's um, I think it. I think it was, yeah, it says well, I think I, I looked it up and I think it, they didn't tell us where it was, but no, I think it was in Dhaka. I mean, I did some research. I think that's where it was. But in any case, it just shows you these women are already very much in the kind of the, the forefront of, of global political conflict. Not like they're just sitting in the village and nothing's happening to them. No, they were already very much in the. the the crossroads of all sorts of important events. And at this time, in the early 70s, women start to become an issue in development. So we, aid agencies start to talk about it, government starts to talk about it. Bangladesh had some of the earliest programs targeting women, like the, it was originally called the VGF program, the Vulnerable Group mm. Feeding Program, became the VGD program. Nowhere else had a program targeting poor rural women in this way, trying to get social protection and you know assets to them. So it was really a really big move for Bangladesh. But the really key thing, uh, the really s central moment, I think, is 1974, and there was this terrible famine. <coughs> now, I, it's a bit difficult to talk about the famine, and it's a little bit controversial uh, in Bangladesh for a number of different reasons. Uh, the reason I really wrote this book was I'd been doing another project with um, a colleague, Professor Fridvers Johan at Dhaka University. We were looking at the 2008 global food crisis. And there were food riots all around the world, uh, including apparently in Bangladesh. It turned out there were no food riots in Bangladesh. Yeah, there wasn't. It was garments workers' yes. wage riots. Yeah. Which, you know, you can call it one thing or another, it doesn't really matter. But the fact is that Bangladesh dealt with that food crisis extremely well, even though it had a caretaker government at the time. Uh, and even better, as soon as it had an elected government back in, this government, current government, takes food security extremely seriously. So when we went, we went to interview all these policymakers, you know, the, the Food Policy Manage Monitoring Unit and the Secretary and this and that, and, uh, and I won't name any names, 
<laughs> but anyone we spoke to, we'd say, why does Bangladesh do so well on food security? Kenya, Mozambique, India even didn't do so well in the, at the moments when it was needed. India actually was much better, but, uh, but many other countries at the same kind of level of Bangladesh's development did not. Uh, and uh, they, all of these policymakers would look at us when we asked this question like we were idiots, and they would, because of the famine. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that nobody talks about the famine in Bangladesh. 1974 is not something people talk about. Um, it, it's almost like it's passed out of the memory. Maybe it's too soon even to talk about it. In, in the Irish famine, I know, it took them 100 years to really start talking about, writing about what happened. But 1974, you know, it, it, the, the 40th anniversary passed while I was writing this book. Nothing was said. Maybe there was one article in one of the English language newspapers that I saw. There was no kind of, nobody called for a commission of inquiry, nobody, no commemorative anything. 1.5 million people probably, probably more, died. Um, there's an official figure of 28,000 or something like that, but it's, the, the credible estimates are, and it's considered to be one of the best documented famines in the world. The data are very good. 1.5 million, that's 2% of the population. 2% of the population, that's a phenomenal number. And this happened in 1974. Now, all famines are very complex events, lots and lots of reasons why they happen. In this case, there was, a, there was a massive flood. The government was barely recovering from the war. It had no infrastructure and so on. There was definitely some smuggling going on to India. The, the, the administrative capacity of the state was totally destroyed. And then the Americans uh, withheld food aid for many different reasons. They said it was because Bangladesh was trading with Cuba, but they withheld the food aid at the vital moment. Uh, and people died. Even if they had the food aid, though, it's not clear that anyone would have really succeeded. They would have succeeded in, in protecting it against the famine because uh, the way it was distributed meant it was mainly the urban middle classes who got whatever the food aid was. <coughs> so 74 was very, very traumatic. Uh, and what we know is at the end of 1974 was that a state of emergency was declared. We, uh, the the, the, the very, uh, recently very popular prime minister uh, created a one-party state, essentially, the Bakshal party, and uh, within uh, eight months had been brutally assassinated with his entire family. So we can't say for sure the relationship between these facts, uh, but it seems likely that there was a loss of legitimacy uh, because governments always lose legitimacy when there's a massive famine. Um, and they certainly lost legitimacy with the other political elites, the contending elites, and with the middle classes, we know that. We don't know what the, what the ordinary person, uh, the, per the kind of people who actually suffered from the famine think, because nobody has recorded that. That's still one of my projects to come. But so, so what we can see is that it meant that the elites lost faith. Those that had already had faith lost quite a lot of faith. So I think the famine was a real turning point after the famine, many, many policies start to change. Lots of things happen after 74. Um, Bakshal was one. But then we had a military uh, ruler came in, uh, 75, 76. And lots of different policies were changed. There was a huge investment in uh, population control, in uh, protecting people against food crises, investments in agriculture. Um, all sorts of things. The, the agricultural markets were, became less closed and more kind of competitive and so on. But the, the shadow of famine certainly still lingers over Bangladesh. And it is one of the things that this, at least this, still the, the bureaucrats and the political classes of this generation, the current generation, still have in the back of their minds, even though we don't talk about it, even though no one's made a film about 1974 famine, even though there's no art about 1974 famine, even though there's only one book ever written that I know of, in English at least, about the 1974 famine, and, and nobody in Bangladesh has ever read it. It's called The Black Coat. It's by a, a Canadian author, a Bangladeshi Canadian. Um, <coughs> so this has had this long shadow, and it continues to have this uh, a concentration, focus on the rural economy, on the rural poor. Bangladesh is very unusual in that we talk about urban bias in general in developing countries. Urban bias means elites, mm -hmm. the ruling class, focus on the, you know, the, the important classes, uh, the urban groups, the middle classes, the, the urban workers sometimes, but not the rural masses. But Bangladesh has always been different. It's known to have a rural bias in its public policy. And that, I think, has to do with the fact of the family. 
And then, of course, we have this massive investment in the population. And here, I think this idea of the basket case of this place that has no resources, only people, was very critical. And you had these Bangladeshi elites back in the day when I did my work on elite perceptions of poverty. We talk to people, they say, you know, we were thinking that we were going to be like Japan. <laughs> we were thinking we we're going to be like Korea, you know, with, you know, homogenous, densely populated, agrarian society. What do we have to do? We have to invest in the people. We have to educate them. We have to raise their standards. We have to make them understand how they can be developed. And this has been a massive success. NGOs, of course, have been very important in this as well. And NGOs have played this kind of complementary and competitive role, I think, in Bangladesh. It's not the case that some people believe that NGOs deliver everything. It is the case that they, they compete sometimes and they sometimes uh, help governments. All sorts of things, tuberculosis control, immunization, and so on. Isn't that a nice picture as well? And I think really that the, the work that Sajita has been doing on the garments industry as well, uh, this, this has also come out of this kind of focus on the rural poor, focus on women, and liberalization of the economy, of course. Uh, the growth of, um, the, growth of the, uh, the garments trade, but also of labor migration. These are the two enormous sectors in Bangladesh. Uh, and we are quite vulnerable, in fact, because we depend so much on these very, very global sectors. You know, the slightest downturn in the global economy, and everyone in Bangladesh goes, ah, what's going to happen to us? Even though we have this enormous market now. But this has really been very important. Uh, realizing that we have so few resources that we have to ensure our people can be part of the global system. Um, I'm going to end on this slide. I just wanted to say a few thoughts about what's happening now and what the future looks like <coughs> with my benefit of my crystal ball. Uh, I think really that uh, Bangladesh has so shown that a certain amount of development, a certain kind of development is definitely possible if the political will is there. And the political will was there, the elite consensus was there. But we're at a stage now where really we need to move up the global value chain in the garments industry, uh, move up the global value chain also in the, in the migration industry. We need to improve the quality of services in Bangladesh, and that does not happen uh, under a regime that, has no, that doesn't allow for rights doesn't allow for uh, uh, freedom of speech and political opposition and competition. Uh, I really do think that uh, all the evidence points to the fact that for Bangladesh's productivity, for its standing in the world, I think it really does need to uh, start to take seriously the issue of human rights. I don't mean just the right to vote and so on, I mean also economic and social cultural rights as well. Um, I think there's one or two really interesting things that are happening in Bangladesh, um, or not in Bangladesh, but related to Bangladesh, which is the, the position Bangladesh now takes in these kind of global policy debates around, for instance, climate change, around labor migration and so on. It really is quite a striking thing to see this former basket case telling the world, you know, how, this is how we do it, taking it, championing the causes of the, of the other low-income countries that have... That have um, that suffer from climate change uh, effects and so on. I think going future, that is really where the new social contract must lie, is in, the, is in a much stronger human rights regime. And I'll leave it there. Questions and comments, yes. Um, thank you for this. This is such a lovely, <coughs> remarkably clear a uh, way of narrating the rise and mm, I don't know what happens next about it. <laughs> I have two questions. Well, one is a comment, a, a totally nerdy word comment, which is basket case. You know, is this World War One phenomenon yeah. of the, the veterans who came back with all four of their limbs amputated and were carried around in baskets. Mm -hmm. um, and I think somewhere there's some really understudied thing about what it meant for like Alexis Johnson to believe somewhere that like the world would carry Bangladesh around in the basket where 30 years before Bengal was the bread basket. Right? Yeah, this was the, exactly. the other basket metaphor that, that comes up. But my question is actually a contemporary one, which is I'm, as you track the ways in which Bangladesh is tied to a global political economy, I'm wondering about the rise of the individual as um, a political, economic, and social actor. And I'm wondering if what you see in that amazing slide of 
Prince Mimosa, <laughs> is in fact homo economicus. Mm. Is that homo economicus mm. there? Mm. As a kind of, um, he is the vision of neoliberal possibility, which seems a rupture from what you're narrating as a once, uh, the social contract you're narrating. Mm. There once was a kind of continuity because <laughs> the idea of the individual as the economic and social actor wasn't written into the ways in which a political base was constituted. Can I answer, because I haven't brought a notebook with me, can I answer <laughs> as we go? Yes, yes. And um, you know, the point about the basket case, fascinating. You know, I, I also did discover that that's what it was. And I was kind of surprised. I always thought the basket case, case meant whatever you put in it will fall out. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and it did come to mean that in Bangladesh. Um, and I think if you're interested in this topic, I'll talk to you more about it. So I've got another paper on this fascinating, the way Bangladesh was constructed as the basket case. Even the concept for Bangladesh, lovely George Harrison, how they framed mm -hmm. Bangladesh, yeah. all of this stuff, deeply, deeply um, problematic in many ways. Yes, I think that's, that is interesting, isn't it? How it just went from being, as you say, the Shkana Bangla, the breadbasket, you know, for the British. That's why their capital was there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then to being this basket case so quickly. Really is a, that, that phrase is very much about a, sh a, a moment in time when actually if you were in Bangladesh in 1971, yeah, it looked pretty bad. All the figures were bad, everything was bad. But this was after a history of two episodes of colonial oppression where no investment had happened in this area, where the people were oppressed on so many different levels for so many years, and they fought two enormous wars as well. So yes, I think it's 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 you know it's both true and completely untrue at the same time. Homo economicus. I mean, he is. Yeah. I mean, it's it's such a contrast. I think that is a very good point. However, he also you know he he, he has this whole kind of team that writes articles about him. Apparently, mm. <laughs> and, and, and I have a. A <laughs> magazine sent to Bragg spe specifically. All the department gets it. About him? Yeah. As a magazine about him? No, he he <laughs> actually produces a magazine, so it comes every three months with the, with his photo. Yeah. And so we keep it as a as our as an anthropological <laughs> artifact. <Yeah. laughs> it's there. We know everything about him. But yes, his, his house is not that grand. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> much, <laughs> have you been inside? Hard. Yeah, outside. No, have you been inside? No, no, but from outside, okay. it's, 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 yeah, okay. Okay, that, that's a neoliberal order. <laughs> 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 but we can chop it at that couple. Yeah, he's, so he's apparently a fraud, you know, but that's another issue. No, 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 but uh, let's, so let's, 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 can I just, just, one, let me just finish yeah. one point about him. He, when he tells his story in these magazines that he funds in that, he actually always situates himself in this story of from the basket case to the to success. success. So yeah. he, he presents his trajectory as in parallel with and no doubt causal for Bangladesh's success. So he, he sees his own success as a kind of nationalist triumph. It's kind of fascinating, really. I was really surprised. I thought that, yeah, he's some kind of rugged individual, you know, yeah. uh, you know like certain presidents in this country, you know, that. But, you know, actually not. You know, he also has this other side, which is, anyway, yeah. Fascinating figure. Sorry, there was one here. No, I, I was going to, I mean, he, he apparently made his money through, you know, his uh, Arms expatriate deal. workers. Arms no, oh, no yeah. he started, he started with human capital. Human. Uh, I mean, he human used to send all these uh, workers to the Middle East and with the middlemen. Yeah. But let's, I mean, so there is this alternate thought that all of these developments in Bangladesh happened in confluence of certain accidents. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's looking at the glass half full. But the point is, the point is, mm -hmm. The NGOs were left alone. Yes. And a lot of the development happened in spite of the government. That is one, one, one thought. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, we can argue about that. But looking forward, as you mentioned, one of the thoughts, I mean, coincidentally, day before yesterday, Paul Ehrlich. Uh -huh. You remember Paul Ehrlich? The population Yes. Yeah. yes. Is so, he still around? So, yeah, he's at Stanford. And he was uh, actually on the, on the news. Mm -hmm. and he, was in a, he was in the Commonwealth uh, Club's uh, you know, discussion. Mm. And he brought up these issues. I mean, of course, he goes back to these issues about the mode of mm. capitalism and how this quote unquote development is being done at the expense of degradation of the environment, yeah. which is true which to is some true. extent. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to go into the, all the details. But what I was going to say is that Bangladesh's potential ascension as a middle income country will deprive it of all the 
the, the breaks it gets, the trade preferences, yeah. Uh, and, and, and unless you, you, you get to the next level of, of selling your services, you, you're pretty much doomed. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that's looking at it, like I said, looking at it, but you have to be prepared for the worst scenario. Bangladesh could have just the same amount of in improvement or w with half the population, because half the population are not doing much. I mean, if you really think about it, you know, this, and you talk about family planning, family planning actually did start right after liberation. No, it, it was in the Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah. And then the government. But not very successful. No, no. But, but yeah. it was still somewhat successful. And the government actually, I was watching the TV uh, discussion amongst the people that are working for these. Uh, they, the government has essentially discontinued, uh, you know, supporting this or, or has re reduced the, the aid. The aid is now provided by all the foreign NGOs and BRAC. And BRAC gets some of its uh, funding from the foreign NGOs, you know, yeah, the yeah. foreign uh, you know, organizations. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think your point about the, the role of the NGOs is very important. I think, and now in a, in a, global, con a global context of closing civic space, which is uh, a current project of mine, it's, it's really interesting to see what's happening in Bangladesh because the NGOs are also now focusing their attention on rescuing this population of a million Rohingya. Who've shown up on the on the on the you know Border, the yeah. fringes of the Bay of Bengal, you know the worst displacement crisis since God knows when, um, and uh, and so then the NGOs have to step up in a context in which nobody really wants NGOs to be doing anything very much anymore, including in Bangladesh. So it is very interesting to see what the government will do about that latitude, that space that it that it gave at that time. Yeah, no, I think it's and Paul Ehrlich though. I mean, I think. The, the idea that, you know, the kind of the Malthusian idea that hunger and population are in any way related has been refuted so many times, so many times, so thoroughly, that Alex Duval uh, calls it a zombie theory. And he says, it doesn't matter how many times you kill this thing, <laughs> it just comes back. <laughs> doesn't matter. All the facts you can throw at it, it comes back. <laughs> So, uh, and Paul Ehrlich is still working, that's amazing. That's but, uh, for us all. you know, uh, <laughs> on, on, that, on that aspect, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you a little story. A gentleman named Sim van der Rien was teaching at Berkeley when I was a graduate student here, and he was considered a kook. Um, he was also the first state architect under Jerry Brown's first governorship of the state in the mid late 70s, okay? This guy was doing sustainable communities at that time, and he, actually put the first solar panel uh, buildings for the state state, house, state building in Sacramento in, at that time. And That's whatever he has, he has actually he prophesized has come true 30 years after the fact. Yeah. So what I'm getting at is Paul Ehrlich, yeah, he talks about Malthusian and as the, you know, aspects of yeah. it. But he's also saying that we are slipping by only at the degradation of our environment, that's true. which is now coming back to bite us. That's true, but that's the model of capitalism. <coughs> yes. Any others? Yes. Sorry, there's one there first, okay. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you because uh, always Bangladesh has been shown to the international community as the basket without having a bottom. <laughs> Uh, they say the, that uh, Bangladesh is the country ravaged by population, flood, <coughs> famine, and in the war, in case of 1971 also, uh, George Harrison, he did an extremely good work in the campaign after his concert, many people came, but the, when I see the poster, a starving child yeah. with having a big tummy uh, sitting <coughs> before a plate, empty plate, as if we are begging, but we have the success stories. 71, we okay. lost the story. Uh, it, it, it doesn't carry the no. uh, story of losses. It, it carries the triumph of Bengalis. Yeah, absolutely. So as a Bangladeshi, I feel that always, whenever I go, I mean, you can also, when I go, we, 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 we did have, uh, we have a lot of uh, success stories. Absolutely. Always we have been displayed as the source of sorrows, uh, ravaged by flood, blah, blah, blah. And, and even Bangladesh is also, in, in case of films, they sometimes display the, particularly the authority films, the films that has been uh, mostly in, uh, the sent to the international mm. film um, festivals. They always try to show our 
um, poverty and backwardness and these kind of... Well, I think those things are there. They are there. I mean, we can't pretend they're not there. And the same allegation was against the it seems to, <laughs> Sometimes it seems to me as a um, self-orientalism. That's a very interesting <laughs> phrase. I'm going to use that. That's really good. Yes, I think I think there is. That's really interesting. I think that uh, I've just been writing a paper um, about that, that the kind of the basket case and the idea that Bangladesh was a uh, a test case for development. This idea that Bangladesh was so hopeless that the, inter the only value it had to the international community, because Bangladesh had no geopolitical importance really, still doesn't. Let's face it. No oil. No, no major security threat, not even uh, important Islamic terrorism to interest the Americans. Mm -hmm. Nothing really that interests the Americans in particular. The British a little bit more because of history. Uh, but uh, really the rest of the world has no reason to be bothered about Bangladesh, uh, except for it's a, it's a way of showing compassion and humanity, uh, a way of giving aid to show <coughs> You know, we, we are good humanitarians. It became a real kind of, I've called it a humanitarian experimentalism. It's like, because we don't actually have any interests in this place, we can try out all sorts of stuff because we are doing it out of the goodness of our hearts. Mm -hmm. So everybody And you know, when you talk to, when you listen to George Harrison, you, if you go and look again on YouTube, great source of research material. Yeah. If you look at this, <laughs> no, but not only the you can watch the, um, you can watch the press conference from 1971 when he announced this, this concert, he's sitting next to Ram Shankar, yes, yes. and he, and 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 the the uh, and of course it's very politically sensitive at the time. Henry Kissinger and Nixon were having a really bad time about the, the fact that they'd allowed this genocide to happen. I hope you've read the Blood Telegram. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, all of this was going on, and so he was very careful. George Harrison also he was he was a Beatle from Liverpool. What does he know about? He, I don't think he even knew that Ravi Shankar was actually from India, Bengal, and this was another country. You know, it was not clear that he knew anything. He said, I don't know anything about the politics. He said, I know nothing. My friend asked me to help, so I'm helping. You know, it was pure compassion, total lack of knowledge, total lack of understanding of the politics. So the waste, the waste love to see that. Absolutely. Hunger, that, uh, Absolutely. That, that, uh, that was the only basis on which they would invest in Bangladesh, was because, you know, we're such good people. I disagree. That Sorry, there's other people have questions no, as well. Sorry, yes. Have, uh, yeah. So I was, I'd like to take you back to the social um, contract because I think, um, and just to, to ask you to talk a little bit more about it, I, I think that the point you made about the elite being similar to the rural masses is just really important. Um, so we can hypothesize that, okay, a certain kind of social contract gets created when the rural masses and the elite feel like they come from the same place, mm -hmm. right? So, all right, and, and then you have the international donors. So you actually didn't fully spell out what that contract was. I want you to mm -hmm. sort of go back yeah. to that. But then what I want to ask of you is the contract today, again, you didn't spell it out. You basically did a hopeful thing. We should. We should be like we that. We should be yeah. like that. Yeah. But what is it now in a moment with greater differentiation where there's a sense that we are not all the same people? Right? What does it look like now? What an excellent question. Oh, I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> and uh, on the social contract, um, I, I think several things. You know, it's, it's not a very popular uh, conception in, in, in political theory now, in sense. It's so vague it can mean anything to anyone. And that's true to some extent, but I think it really helps, mm -hmm. you know, in post colonial countries where actually you can see the social contract Absolutely. being negotiated. Absolutely. And I was thinking, uh, in fact, this was Zimbabwe. I keep keep saying Zimbabwe when I mean somewhere else. In Zimbabwe recently, they have been talking about the new social contract when they have their... Con so you can see in these post-colonial countries the social contract getting negotiated there and then. That's kind of fascinating. So you can see it happen. In Bangladesh, I would say it was what we would call a domination contract. So, you know, you're very strong, I'm very weak, but still I get something from being in the relationship. I, don't, I can't hold you to fully to account, but I have some leeway. So it's a domination contract, that's one thing. Another thing I think is that it's, and I've been working a bit more on this more recently, it's a very specific contract. It's not uh, the government is responsible for doing everything. The elites have to do everything, or the donors have to do everything. Very specifically, I think, what we can see in the political competition, the political discourse, is that when there's a disaster, when there's a food crisis, then you get this bargaining and this you know, the newspapers come out, the opposition comes out, you get the 
you know, the, uh, the labor unions come out, everyone says, what are you doing, government? Come on. Uh -huh. The NGOs start shouting. Uh -huh. So it, it's, a, it's a kind of preemptive, almost, accountability that kind of triggers the social contract. And I, I think it's, it's very specifically a contract of, you mustn't let us die. Uh -huh. a, I call it a subsistence <coughs> crisis contract. Don't let us die. You know, we have to at least make sure that we have a fair chance of getting through to the next season. I, I'd say that was probably it. Now, what, what is it now? I think that those the way the way a country's political economy starts certainly obviously has enormous you know institutional and other cultural legacies. Mm -hmm. I think in Bangladesh people don't recognize very much the role of the government yeah. because a lot of the time it's when things don't happen that the government has acted. It's when the food the rice price doesn't double. It's when nobody dies in major f or few people die in major cyclones. So these are things that don't make the headlines. Oh, nothing happened. Oh, you know, how, is, how are you going to praise the government for that? But when you look at the historical sweep, when you look at how many people did used to die in these things, and how many more people we are, and how much worse the climate change situation is, how much more volatile the global economy is as well, it's quite remarkable. Didn't really answer your question. You did partly. You just did answer the part about the, the difference. Is there a way in which... Uh, differentiation is creeping into the population, which then will change the relationship between. Yes, I think I think that's why the lovely Prince Musa comes up here. I think it's going to change. I think you now have much less a kind of a you know deshirbari type of relationship and more of a employee employee relationship between, if you like, the elites and the masses, who may be garments factory owners or labour you know company owners. So you've got a much more class-based relationship than you had before. Yeah. That will change everything. And what about ethnic differentiation? Uh, and that, I think, is also there. And I think that um, <coughs> I think that urbanization will have a big difference. Uh, I think this younger generation... I mean, when I, when I did this talk at the Dhaka Lit Fest last year, so many young people came to me afterwards. I, I didn't know we had a famine. And they weren't... Actually, I would say young people. Some of them were not much younger than me. You know, they, they would have been alive in 1974. But nobody's talked to them about it. They don't remember any of this. That's the thing that really worries me, is that there's a whole generation that doesn't know that we had these, this enormous disaster. And they know about 43, but they don't know but about 74. But 71 has been uh, repeatedly revised by the government parties, led by different political mm -hmm. parties. Mm -hmm. Whenever government comes, whenever BP comes, they, they narrate 71 yeah. through the Bangladeshi nationalism and uh, just uh, they focus on Dia's legacy. So it revised several times. I don't think there's anything particular to Bangladesh about that. I think yeah, that's true everywhere. So, yeah. uh, I think we, you know, the, the victors always tell the story, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. sorry, there's one back Yeah. Um, uh, by 2041, we'll be a developed country. Bangladesh will be a developed country. And how is your book title? Okay. It is, it is government rights, okay? How is your book title uh, different from Bangladesh government's claim that it will be a developed country by 2041? I think Bangladesh has every chance of being a very prosperous country in 2041. Every chance. But it is very dependent on the, the global the economy. It will be different at that time. That we well, it was the aid lab. It has faster. been the aid lab. The history doesn't go away just because you get rich <laughs> in the future. Right. Uh, that's what it was. That was the start of it. That's why it's been so important in uh, in Bangladesh's development. I don't think it, 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 it is still the aid lab. In fact, you know the, the Bangladesh government is wonderful. I love this. Uh, I wish I had a copy of the book with me. I don't have. Uh, the Bangladesh government likes to likes to claim its its successes and tell the world, look, you should learn from us. We we know how to do development. It's a it's a thing of great wonder. I think it's fantastic. From being experimented on, they're saying, no, we'll, let, we'll, we'll show you how it's done now. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, that, that really makes me happy, actually, that yeah. <laughs> For now, yeah. Uh, Yami, uh, I have um, one question to ask, uh, and just to clarify, because um, the photo of Prince Mugosa doesn't do justice to the, the upcoming... I'm going to move him away, because no, no, he's no, just okay. too <laughs> dominant <laughs> in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> because we are, uh, I need that. Um, yeah. But the thing is, like, the kind of contract that you're talking about uh, with the elite, and um, there's a whole new reverse uh, farmhouse culture where people are going back to their land, 
and building new build Bagan Bari. Bagan Bari. And it's not only in Ghazipur or Yete Nutun Jaga ki Nekurche. They're literally going back to their home to claim their space. There's a very different kind of movement that I see, um, which would be comparable with uh, David Oppenhoff's work of, of going to suburban London, moving away from the city, and, and uh, having a life uh, where people would go there mm -hmm. for a day or two and uh, have their vacation homes. I uh, see, yeah. Uh, and the thing is, like, many of the people that I know, uh, because um, it's not exactly the same same population we are talking about. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm not. I'm talking about the affluent middle class. Um, there are people who are moving away from Dhaka, living in um, in Urubayon would be in, in in three years or four years. You will see that um, Bushan, not Bhushan and Barinara, but Urubayon city is extending. Mm -hmm. So there's a different kind of organization, but also the, this. Um, not only the Ghazipur or, or Nanganj, but people are going back to Silet, people are going back to, um, suppose, uh, but not to, not to settle. Um, no, it is, no, no, not to, no, not only weekend homes, mm -hmm. going back and forth. So they are re, like this, you know, we missed something yeah. in, in, um, in 80s and 90s because yeah. everybody was busy to come come and make. Yeah. And but also, Dhaka was, you could breathe the air in the 1980s. Yes, yeah, of course. Oh, but, but the whole po the, the point I'm trying to make, it's a different kind of social con contract. Absolutely. Because yeah. they are reclaiming the land that they left. I think that's, you know, you, you, you talk about the middle class. I mean, my book doesn't deal with the middle class at all. Partly because Hardly. the middle class was the elite in those days. There was no elite, there was a small middle class. Yeah, it was I, I think essentially we're and talking now about we the similar Yeah, to, 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 to we similar. don't, we, but it's just expanding. Don't know anything. Yeah. yeah, expanding. So the we'll change everything, I think. Yeah, yeah. That, the, and the, the, the thing is, like, and, and the way I see the development of middle class, not only in terms of different kinds of capitals, but also the special mobility. So, Gandaria to Dhanwandi to uh, Baridhara Bhushundhara to going back to the ancestral place. Going it's back to Gandaria. Gandaria. And it's, it's a new ancestral. Um, so for me, that, that is fascinating, which mm. is happening in the last five mm. years, not even 10 years. But I think it, this picks up your point also about the, the changing nature of the social contract and, and the differentiation. I mean, I think the thing of the Baganbari, the phenomenon of, and I, you know, I haven't, I haven't lived in Bangladesh now for almost 10 years, so I haven't, I spent a lot of time there, but I haven't, you know, been living like that. I'm not. I'm not one of these people going off to the weekends. But but I know it happens. It strikes me not as closeness to the population, but mm -hmm. as a kind of elite strategy mm -hmm. to show how yeah. you know, we we are in touch with nature. You know, it's like no, it, it is it's that. Close to the it's like buying art. It's like buying art. It's like buying art. But at the like, same time, uh, listening to classical music. It's, yeah. it's a uh, 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 it's a in um, ha uh, like a cultural strategy distinction. Yeah. Distinction, distinction, of course, exactly. distinction, but at the same time, people are reclaiming the lands. Yeah. But without like the way that the zamindari used to work, where you part of the logic of the zamindari was that you would look after the peasants. Mm -hmm. In this model, you have the model of the zamindari, yeah, but yeah, without, yeah, without, yeah, without 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 yeah, the kind without of without the functional yeah. relationship. Yeah, which yeah. I think actually. But, but the thing is, like the the politician are using the spaces because this elites they're making a new social network with this people. Oh, okay. no, but so okay. it's, it's a different kind of I don't know I, it's oh, very I interesting but I was wondering if anyone else had any thoughts or questions before we have a full because I'd love to talk more about this I really want to talk more about this any other thoughts or questions or no uh, yes I'm oh, sorry yes uh, I mean you mentioned about the two uh, woman prime minister is, I would say, not Begum, that perpetually <laughs> ruled from 91. Uh, but there was a military government before that, uh, under civilian guise. But that government, I think, but I was there at that time, so I felt that they did the decentralization more than all these, you know, perpetual political parties together. He, he broke the... You know, Ashad here. Yeah. Yes. But there's, there's no decentralization in Bangladesh. It's a the fully centralized system, state. The open zero system, the judicial system, uh, yeah. look at the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, I, I think that was the backbone of the pharmaceutical industry was created during that time. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah. And all these things, I, I think there is, well, I mean, I, 
I, I'm not spouting any military rule or anything like that. <laughs> no, I, but, yeah, they, <laughs> they, they, they were I'm important foundations. That, that the political parties should, I mean, I haven't seen anything like, okay, to bridge the disparity between the rich and the poor. I have a, I have a fear that Bangladesh, the way, I mean, it's heartening to see it's developing like that, but I can compare these people to the Russian oligarchs that have ruled. Yeah. Yeah, I really yeah. am going to yeah. take it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I put her in <laughs> <laughs> I love her. She's great. She's great. So yeah, no, th I think that there's an important point, which is that the, um, the military rulers, and they were kind of soft authoritarians always. Yeah. Yeah. You always have a Bangladesh, I think uh, Sarah White put it very nicely when she said, it's a, it's a it's a weak state in a strong society. Yes. You know, it's it's always very very dependent on, on. Uh, Is it uh, any different now? No, it's the same. <laughs> it's but it's a much stronger state than it was. It can do some of the things it wants to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the in the early seventies, the government couldn't even keep the people alive if it wanted to. It just couldn't do it. It just didn't have the capacity. Now it has that capacity. Uh, but I think that the interesting thing that happened in the uh, second half of the seventies and the eighties, and I was also there in those days, um, some things were put in place. And military governments are always interesting because they have to show certain kinds of uh, performance to be legitimate. They have to make sure certain things are done. I think disaster relief really was, uh, was, was really improved at those in those times. Um, and those foundations were certainly built on by the, by the democratic governments that, that came up, democratic, you know, democratic, multi-party governments, let's say, that came afterwards. Um, but I think there is something there. There was, there was, there was some foundations. I don't think decentralization was very successful. It remains a very centralized state. If you look at anything like uh, who pays the, the school teacher in the village, is a list gets made. It goes up technically to the district, uh, not to the district, Upuzala, to the district, and then. But basically, some guy in Dhaka is sitting there checking <coughs> off who gets paid. Can you imagine how centralized is that in a country of 180 million or whatever it is today? See, uh, when uh, I can, um, when I just came out of med school at the time, just go, you know, my friends and who have never been to the villages, uh, we had to go and be at the health conferences around the country, yeah. and uh, uh, yeah, for a year. Otherwise, they won't. The government won't let us practice. They won't, you know. So that was my first. Touch with the did religion. you did you actually go there? Yes, many doctors I, I went, and because my you know <laughs> my father insisted. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did you go somewhere there. nice though? Yeah, no, I so went to a place called Rajor in Madaripur. Madaripur, oh yes, wow! Yes, and it was very well known. That's uh, proper uh, you know, that was a, uh, a hotbed of uh, underground uh, yeah, activity yeah. during politics mm -hmm. during that time, and I stayed there for a year sure and a half, right. and it. It, it was the most refreshing experience I had in my life, yeah, and um, and I believe that that was needed somewhere down the road because of this urban elites who had opened their eyes. You, you can know. still beat the system. My younger brother went to our ancestral upazila. Oh, really? <laughs> that was lucky. <laughs> but it's it's you know you know the Chinese government, maybe the Vietnamese government. Some governments can make doctors and teachers and so on. And they have to say that. Forced labor. But Bangladeshi state, as I say, is weak in a strong society. One way or another, people get away with, on the whole, not really being there a lot, I think. And, and I think that, you know, that, that's one of the reasons for the failure of decentralization as well. It's like you've got this very close relationship between the, the center and the, and, the, and the rural areas, that, and the MPs now embody that closeness. You know, you're, Straight from Dhaka down to the village, you've got this kind of very tight, short line which you don't have in other places. Think about India, I mean, how many levels and layers of administration and politics? Oh, that's really just the one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.